I want to thank uh, June Freeman uh, and the uh, Art of the uh, Architecture uh, Lecture Series, uh, sponsored by uh, the U of A School of Architecture, by the Arkansas Chapter of the American Institutes of Architects, and by the Arkansas Art Center for, for uh, your support and help tonight. And I want to remind everybody, I've been told this by three of the architects, for you all to sign in to get your credits or your continuing education credits. So be sure and sign. Uh, I, I, want, I, I want you to get credit for, for Jim Polshak being here. Um, before we introduce the speaker, I, I want to say that we had, uh, today's a really special day in Arkansas. And uh, today is the birthday of Ruth Lincoln who today turns 111 years old. Uh, two years ago, Ruth Lincoln was a featured speaker here as part of this public program series. And you can see her uh, interview on our website. But some of her friends are here today um, that played bridge. They played bridge with Mrs. Lincoln today. On her 111th birthday, she got a new card table for her birthday. So on behalf of the Clinton School, I want to wish Ruth Lincoln a very happy birthday. She is the oldest living Arkansan, and she's the 59th oldest person in the world. So it's a great day for her. <laughs> Earlier today, we had Lee Bollinger, the president of Columbia University. Uh, and I thought maybe President Bollinger might uh, sneak in to hear his good buddy speak tonight, but we were thrilled. Uh, to have him um, as part of the series, uh, his, his lecture on freedom of the press, and then he spent uh, about an hour with our students. Uh, you know, to have the president of Columbia University here uh, was, a, was indeed a great honor and privilege for us. Uh, and I want to welcome Ellen Polshek, the wife of Jim Polshek and a very good friend of mine and Billy's she uh, spent a lot of time in Arkansas when this library was being built, and we welcome you home. Welcome back to the South. I want to thank our volunteers and all the others who helped make this uh, evening possible. Now, building a presidential library, designing a presidential library is no easy task. Also, it is one of the highest honors that can be paid to an architect because there are only 12, there will soon be 13. And so only 12 architects, architectural firms have had the honor and the privilege of designing a presidential library. Jim Polshek is one of them. And he and his Polshek Partnership Architect team, along with a great group of local design architects from Arkansas, put together not only the Clinton Center, but this whole complex, including the park, uh, and I think just did a fabulous job. He's come back here today. He's been inspecting his work. Uh, and where's Bruce? Bruce, uh, he's got a list for us. <laughs> and now it's only going to cost you a couple of million. I looked at it. No, but, but, uh, but he's come to inspect his work, and we're very, very glad. You know, when you look, when you, when you think about Jim Polshek's achievements, and he told me not to say much because he said it reminded him of a eulogy. But, but you look at the Kennedy Center and you look at Carnegie Hall, you look at the Rose Center for Earth and Space, you look at the Ed Sullivan Theater, uh, just among his many, many museums and art centers. And, and then you go on the college campuses. You can go to Chapel Hill, to Columbia, to Cornell, to Michigan, to NYU, to Ohio State, to Penn, to Smith, to Syracuse, to UCLA, to Yale among many, many others where the fingerprints and the work of Jim Polchak uh, enlightens and, and brightens college campuses. There was one particular building, though, that had a huge impact on the Clinton Center, and that was a building at Stanford, where in the, when, during the competition to pick the architect, one President Clinton, who was making that decision, dispatched his daughter, a senior at Stanford, to go check out a building on the Stanford campus that the Polshak firm had done. The Cantor Center for Visual Arts on the Stanford campus. Chelsea gave a glowing report back to the president. Not that that was the total decision-making process, but let me assure you, it did carry a lot of weight. 
Uh, and when she graduated, her graduation party was uh, in that building in a Polshek center, a Polshek work. When we worked on this project, this was a challenging project for a lot of reasons. But this bridge to the 21st century, uh, which won the National uh, Architect's highest award, Jim Polshek uh, was masterful and was so enjoyable to work with. One story, and then I'm going to get him up here because it's not a eulogy. We were walking along the site, and I was making the comment, you know, how beautiful it would be with all the glass looking out over the river. And what a wonderful, great look that would be. And he let me go on and with my architectural skills, <laughs> design what I thought was a very beautiful entryway into the building. And with the highest respect and courtesy, he, he said to me and very nicely, you know, Skip, I'm going to give you a good view of the river. You're going to see it very well. But you're not going to turn your back on your city. Your front door is going to face your city so that people who drive by that interstate and see people going in that building will know that it is a welcoming center for all. Well, he was right, I was wrong, and lots and lots of people have come to see the great work of James Polshek. Would you welcome back to Little Rock, Jim Polshek. Gosh, lots of people. Uh, thank you, Skip. Uh, Skip, is, uh, Skip has been my shepherd uh, since we began this in uh, 99. I think it was 99. Uh, there's a little book they sell. I should have brought one with me at the, uh, the bookstore. It just has the number on it. I think it says 2000, 2099. Nobody understands what that book's about because the doesn't say in the cover, Clinton Presidential Center, but that's it. So go in and ask for it. Um, I am particularly honored, that, and it's a, an amazing coincidence. I don't know if he's here this evening. But we'll, I'm going to see him later. Uh, Lee Bollinger is the president of Columbia University. He was the president of the University of Michigan. Uh, and before that, he was the provost at Dartmouth. And uh, he's a great constitutional lawyer a great Democrat, uh, and, uh, but he is also a great fan of architecture and of architects. He understands, I think, the, more, than, more than most leaders of great institutions, the, the, the social obligation of an architect that goes far, far beyond bricks and mortar or the technology, the various technologies we have to deal with. So I, I'm, here he is. He gave a really interesting talk on the First Amendment, which will come up in a few of the most recent buildings uh, that, that we've done in, in the office. Um, Bruce Lindsay, who, he may be listening in, to the floor upstairs. There he is. I knew. <laughs> what a position. <laughs> you can't walk out easily either. <laughs> um, Bruce and, uh, and I think uh, so many other people were responsible for our being here, not least of which is uh, Kaki Hockersmith here as the, um, as Skip asked me to talk about the Clinton Library, I said, why should I talk about the Clinton Library? Everybody there knows the Clinton Library and they've been through it and so forth, they know all about it. And he said that's not so. Um, so I'll go into some, some depth, not, not terrible, and I know there are a lot of architects and perhaps architecture students uh, that may have showed up here from Fayetteville uh, down here, and so it's always difficult to talk about to that kind of double layer uh, audience, um, but I'm going, to, I'm, going to make that, I'm going to make that attempt. Um, I know that for those who will get credit, I think Skip mentioned that, uh, you'll sort of dig out of what I'm saying. I've also been given a, um, a fairly short time schedule, so there, when I get to some of the pretty pictures 
of the library. I'm going to go very fast because you, you, those you have seen. Uh, so I'm going to start off, if I can have the, the uh, lights off. Um, trying to think if I miss thanking anybody, but there are so many people, and I can't name them all, but the, to be here in Choctaw, uh, when I saw it in my mind's eye not so many years ago, is, is an amazing experience. So I will, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'll try to make this thing work uh, properly. Uh, that is a double page spread from a document that we prepared after the president said, and this is before we were selected as architect, um, he said after the first meeting, and I'll, I'll come back to the first meeting after I show it, he said, go down to Little Rock, would you please, and take a look at several building sites there. And uh, there's one that I kind of prefer, but I've been, had a lot of pressure on me to pick the other site, which is across in North Little Rock, directly across the street from downtown, so you kind of face the river and face the town. I went with my uh, younger partner, Richard Alcott, collaborator, cannot possibly be given enough credit for his contributions to this design. Um, certainly one of the most cultivated, I say young man, he's not a young man anymore. He's, <laughs> he's up there in the middle. Uh, nevertheless, we came down here on a fairly nice day and we walked out into that brownfield and that mess of buildings there and we went up on the roof of one of those buildings and we looked around and we said, well, why do we even have to go to the other site? This, this is clearly it, though we did go to the other site. It, 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 it was an, a clear and obvious choice that many of the architects who live around here because they're more familiar with what goes on. We then prepared a document. Uh, it kind of folded out and out and out and out and out, about 20, 22 feet long. And we came down to Washington uh, to meet in the map room of the White House. And the president was late and con contrary to, uh, I know everybody would giggle, but actually for us, he was never late. All the meetings, he was almost always on time. And people say, I don't believe it, but it, it, it was true. Anyway, he was late that night, and when we walked in, he arrived uh, red-faced and agitated uh, and somewhat out of breath, and he said, as we speak, they are killing our children. And he was there within minutes of the, uh, of the tragedy in uh, Littleton, uh, Oklahoma, at Columbine High School, and uh, Colorado, rather at Columbine High School, and he said, excuse me if I'm interrupted by AIDS, uh, I'm going to have to say something on the radio. In spite of that, <clears throat> he was able, with a few interruptions, to concentrate on this long document, which was the impressions that Richard and I and others in the office had gained from research and for thinking about it. And one of the very first of the uh, pieces we pulled out was something that I had kind of insisted on. Um, we studied the president and his family and his life in the city and tried to put it all into two pages about 17 inches by uh, 11 inches wide. So you're seeing two sides of it. And he looked at it and he kept pointing to different things. And he's such a quick study that within seconds he said, Hillary's there 14 times, I'm there only 10. So I was a little taken aback, and I said, because, you know, I don't put together every piece of paper in the office. You have an idea, and, and then I realized why it was. I said, Mr. President, there is a reason for that. There are two brilliant young ladies who will work on this project if we get the commission who put this together. <laughs> anyway, it was the beginning, a sad and bittersweet beginning, but the beginning, I think, of a kind of romance President Clinton, as all of you know here, depends on intuition, and intuition and chemistry uh, are a great deal. They can lead you in wrong directions, but in his case, they led him in, in mostly right ones. Um, so we, we started out. Now, you can see how that flipped quickly from, from sketch to the real thing. That's a view, of course, nobody gets because you have to be really elevated to get that view. This is where it began. Um, 
the first time we were summoned to the White House to meet with him, you can see the date. It was February 24th, 1999, and as we stood in the anteroom waiting to go in, out came uh, Tom Daschle and uh, Dick Army and um, I'm going to forget the third person. You'd probably remember, Bruce. But they had a big budget squabble or whatever, and they all looked kind of hand dog walking out. And we walked in and we uh, took our places. Now, I took that photograph that appeared on the front page of the New York Times and through the genius of Photoshop, put our faces in there. <laughs> Richard Alcott is lank and tall and handsome. He's on the end, and I'm just old and fat, and Kevin is young and even fatter. <laughs> and when we, when we met uh, that day in the White House, um, Kevin and he came up and they shook hands, and. Kevin got four words out of his mouth, and the president said, are you from Arkansas? He said, yes, sir. He said, are you one of the, are you one of the McClurkins from Little Rock? And he said, thank heaven, no, sir. <laughs> but not from very far south. But it was in a way with, I think, all of us, it was kind of love at first sight. We were very relaxed. He, he asked us which of the presidential libraries we liked the most. And we gave the right answer, which was Kennedy's by I.M. Pei. Um, he, he didn't deeply probe uh, as an attorney would. It was kind of feeling. He had been familiar um, with uh, some of our buildings. And Chelsea, indeed, uh, had that discussion with him about the building at Stanford. And he had um, visited the uh, uh, Inventors Hall of Fame in Akron, Ohio, my hometown. Uh, while well, it was Ill, under construction. And Hillary had also been at the dedication of the King Juan, King Juan Carlos II of Spain Center at New York University. It's the Spanish Cultural and Educational Center there. And uh, they had known the king and queen and, and entertained them at the White House. So there were, there were connections. And, um, and then uh, we didn't hear anything for months at least three, four months, and we figured it was all over because um, they had looked at many architects. Uh, he somehow just, it, nobody was right, and then this turned out to be right. Uh, and we got a phone call, and I was on a little island off the coast of Maine when somehow it was either reported on the news or the paper even before I think we got the phone call, and I, of course, was overjoyed and overwhelmed and scared to death. Uh, <laughs> Um, this, of course, you all recognize the site. There's little that I can say about it, and you're going to see in a minute, though. Um, when we started in, and this likely was before we had the commission, too, I'm trying to remember, we did three schemes in the office using, as architects who are slightly, slightly over-intellectualized what they're doing, um, but at the same time have a great respect for history do, uh, we, we picked three different ways of approaching this. One is the villa, then I can go backwards. One was the plaza, or the piazza, and one is the campus. And I'm not gonna go into these in detail, but they all have one thing in common, other than depending upon uh, Palladio's Villa Rotunda in this case, and the Campidoglio in the next one, and the University of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson's masterpiece in the third. But they all had one thing in common, which Skip mentioned, that is, they all faced the river. I think that anybody would come, you'd say, well, wait, we've got a beautiful river, we want to look at the river. Um, and we weren't sure that was right, but we had little models, little hardwood models of each of these schemes, and we left them in the White House, and we understood later, maybe through cocky, that they played with these models, because they could plug them into the site and take them out and exchange pieces and so forth, like a game. And but we didn't hear, uh, hear or sense that kind of rumble of, wow. Um, and one day, when we came out here, after we were selected, actually, and after we visited the site, it's the second one, and there's the third one, which was, you know, there are many buildings. Remember, at this time, the program was quite a bit larger than what was built. I mean, that's what you do at the beginning. Uh, the, the foundation and all were dreaming of all sorts of uh, uh, add-ons add and, and, and no subtract-ons, but we 
came back to reality fairly soon. And uh, if one had built any one of those, as in this, you could see we were talking about uh, the past. Uh, uh, I think we all agreed that we must save Choctaw Station, that it was an extremely valuable historic relic. I think it was on the National Register of Historic Places in any event, so it would have been a big battle to get rid of it. Um, but since the Clinton School was really part of the program, has always obviously remained so, that seemed to be a great idea to use it in, in that way. Uh, but had we done this, um, it would have uh, been a building facing due north uh, across the river uh, and the west on the side. And then, of course, you can see the, that the city uh, would have been um, on, its, on its western side. And as we stood up there, we realized after studying a bit about, um, about Little Rock, and I'm going to come to this, which is the issue of the park system of Little Rock that flows along the river on both sides, not everywhere. Ultimately, though, the plan is. This is the Six Bridges area. These are a little bit out of whack uh, in terms of timing. This is uh, a meeting after we were uh, selected. Um, and we were down there, and, and you can see the, uh, that's Nicole Seligman, who was a, a counselor uh, to the president and who he had empowered uh, to um, vet preliminarily the architects, uh, and, and, and she did so. And then that's, I'm sure that's Kaki right there, uh, and Kevin and myself, Richard, and the president. So that's the cast of characters. It says project team. That's not entirely accurate, but it, it's a nice title. Um, what's interesting about this, and when I mention collaboration, is the number of places all over the nation that people came from to participate in various aspects of the building. I could not possibly go into them all. I mean, obviously, most are from here. Fam familiar names, uh, uh, McClellan and Witzel, and uh, oh gosh, I don't want to start any of the names because you'll come to Polk Stanley in a little bit. And, and others, Cromwell, and that, that we've worked with so very closely. But then, of course, we had many consultants from New York as well. And I think in some ways, maybe most important uh, out here from uh, was Gary Eichenhorst, who was the owner's representative. That's the whip. Uh, that's like the Speaker of the House, I guess. He's the one who mediates between the client and the architect, protecting one against the other and making sure that the budget is respected and the schedule is respected. So it is a deeply and profoundly collaborative uh, process. And it's not one that I personally, or Richard as the principal designers, uh, got uh, deeply into. But Kevin led the kind of technical team and so forth, and you'll meet them all in a, in a, in a few minutes here. Um, I'm not, this is just a little teeny tidbits of, uh, of all the pieces that went into it. but the. The program and the research into that program is, is really very, very important. Uh, we, uh, they selected, that is the president and, uh, and also selected an exhibition designer, uh, I think pretty, pretty simultaneously, I'm not sure about that, um, Ralph Applebaum and Associates from New York, uh, with whom we had worked before. Uh, they were the ones who did the, the Rose Center for Earth and Space with us uh, currently we're doing the um, Salt Lake City uh, Museum of uh, Natural History together. I mean, you, you, there are a lot of buildings. I think there are a few I'll come to later. The blue simply represents um, the aspect of exhibits, the materials that go into it. Uh, the top big blue piece are, uh, are a greater section of that. Then there are dark brown are archives, and the red are yellow spaces, and then there's ancillary support spaces. And all of that had to be pulled together on a 20-acre site, but not over all 28 acres, because that site um, was desperately in need of cleaning up, which our, our actual res restoration of the site um, is one of the major factors leading to the lead uh, platinum uh, that this building represents, one of very few in the, in the nation. And then we went around and we looked at presidential libraries. There are um, a few, well, there's one mistake on here. Uh, one we started by the Nixon Library was not one of the presidential library systems uh, until they gave their documents to the National Archives not so long ago. The one that <coughs> is not a part of the system is this one here. 
uh, one of my young people said, oh, you know, we left one out. We left out Rutherford B. Hayes. I said, I don't think so. They said, oh, yes, yes, he has a presidential library, and it's in Fremont, Ohio, so being an Ohioan, when I heard that, I said, well, put him in. <laughs> but it's really a family library and not one of, not one of the archives uh, library systems. Um, Richard and I went to different libraries. He went to Carter, I went to Reagan. I think we both knew and had been to Kennedy and Johnson. Um, never did visit uh, uh, Truman or Eisenhower's. <laughs> and there are a few others that we, we went to. Oh, Roosevelt, of course, in Hyde Park, because I have a house very close to that. Uh, and, and concluded without scientific precision to it, that presidential libraries have begun to take on the personalities or the central attitudes of the presidents that they are meant uh, to both celebrate and to save the documentations and make them available to scholars and future generations. So that, that Lyndon Johnson's, which is on the campus of, oops, sorry, which is on the campus uh, of the University of Texas in Austin, is, um, I was thinking of the word, it's, it's imperial. It's very imperial, which is really not fair to Johnson's memory, but it is its architect, Gordon Bunshaft. Um, he did not want the Oval Office, that is the architect, thought that was kitsch. And LBJ said, I want that Oval Office. But by the time they woke up, the building was well along in construction, and the only way to do it was put it up at the top and then shrink it by one-eighth size. So anybody who's ever been there, even the television sets in it are one-eighth smaller than real scale. <laughs> it's, it's really very weird. Uh, it's a kind of Alice in Wonderland experience. And, and Reagan's, uh, that was intended to be at Stanford, but that was prevented from that by a uh, revolution of the faculty, ended up um, up in a kind of flat, arid, but rather beautiful um, a plateau uh, outside of Los Angeles. And it's very folksy, very campy, like a camp, a little like a ranch. It's very soft. I think it's sort of popular. People have seen that, but you can barely get to it. Uh, and, and Kennedy's is very elegant. It's, it's, I'm sure that, uh, that Jackie had a, a, a very large role in picking I Am Pay uh, to do that. And I'm not going to go through them all, but um, and oh well, and then there's Bush, uh, Bush One's li library there, which is, I guess, banal is the most, um, it's the only word I can kind of use. It's it's um, it's it's really not much. Uh, it's vanilla ice cream without the beans. <laughs> And inspired or, or, or not inspired by that, by that, we came back and we, we went to work. The core of this, the heart of a presidential library, is that part which few of you have seen or probably will ever seen, and it's this. It is that which is stored below, not the, the, the uh, day logs of the White House which are above, which we initially intended, I think Ralph's intention was that somehow they'd be open and people could pull out a date and look at it. Of course, they're profoundly confidential and nobody was going to be able to touch them. And now I notice they're under plexiglass as well, which I think is a, a new, um, maybe they always were, I don't recall that. But the, the systems of storage and the place of storage was very much part of the concept of the building. Um, and that brings us to, to the site, the research and analysis. I noticed that this map, which I remember taking this photograph of as you walk into the bar at the Capitol Hotel, is now gone. And in its place is a portrait, probably of the owner, I don't know, but um, that, that's, what's, that's what's there. Um, and this is what it was when we visited it, um, a really a wreck, a brownfield. But it had one thing, every modern architect um, is at heart an industrial archaeologist. And when we saw that bridge, we said, that bridge has to stay. And when we came back on that trip that I'd mentioned earlier and went up on the roof and saw that bridge, the angle of that bridge, uh, the, the, the direction of the tracks as they went by Choctaw, uh, the idea 
was one of those light bulbs, and that is turn the building perpendicular to the river. Have it face west and elevate it. And the elevation part will come up in a moment. So this was just what we saw as we stood there looking around, and there we end up with the building that we're in. Now, one day the president said, why, why does the two parts of this building, um, why aren't they parallel with the, with the bridge? And um, he asked always interesting questions, and those questions always required answers. There was no short answer to it. We sat down and explained to him with the use of drawings, uh, some done by George Hargraves, a brilliant, wonderful landscape architect who's responsible for that, that, that landscape around the building, that there are two grids to, our, to a Little Rock. And you can see the one in orange, and you can see the one in green. The green, of course, continues across the North Little Rock. Uh, the orange is uh, a, a later one. And in respect to those grids and, uh, and the highway system that rides in between them, um, we explained that we were reflecting that and capturing, we hope, even though 99.4% of all people visiting it on the ground wouldn't quite get that. But it wasn't important. All these things do slowly seep into the mind. So the, 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 the six bridge urban design area, and I remember very early on being deeply uh, impressed by the urban design work that had gone on, I think, under the direction of Dean. Um, I'm going to forget Dean's last name, and I apologize if he's in the room here, but you all know him. Dean what? Yeah, and, and they, they actually were up in the market. They had little offices up on top of the, uh, the market down, down the street. and. Um, and then, of course, we obviously read, I want to build a bridge to the 21st century. Um, and so the first thing we did was look at buildings that were bridges of not the 21st century. Um, excuse me while I get some water here. So, uh, and, and, and frankly, I don't even know the top left one. But the lower left is a building that I've been very, always very deeply impressed with its uh, Shenan So and the Loire. That's here, of course, this you recognize from Venice. But this was really an amazing, it is, it is in fact a dwelling that connects uh, really two sides of the river without disturbing the flow and the reflections uh, of, of the water. And it is a building, that, by the way, that, that was a, a very profound influence on what is one of my favorite buildings, other than the Clinton Library, which is a community mental health center in Columbus, Indiana, which also I built over a river uh, to avoid uh, allowing the, or to, to disallow the Army Corps of Engineers from taking out a hundred old sycamore trees and ruining a public park. And so the solution of a bridge to mental health, which at that time is what I, I, I said to the, to the owners. They thought I was crazy, but it ended up uh, being built in that way. So now you see um, very clearly how turning the building around allowed for something else. And that is the ability to allow people to traverse east-west or west-east on a walk or a run um, along the river, that is, and to be able to restore the, the landscape of the river back to what it was a thousand or two thousand years ago. Not all of that work has been completed yet. Some will come in later stages uh, directly outside here. <clears throat> but that, that, to me, was maybe the building's most important um, social achievement. And there you can see it uh, in, in a diagram very clearly. Now, at that time, we had a much more ambitious program. You can see early on there were things popping out from underneath. There were ancillary buildings here, which we thought might be the Clinton School. Uh, there was a, a, a chapel and a burial uh, garden, chapel and garden for the president and his family. Um, that land is still there. It's landscaped and so forth, but it doesn't have program on it at this time. The future, uh, that's a possibility. But then you see the two geometries here, the two lines, the, the arrows, the view, and of course, all the way across, you know, from K 
Capitol to the front door and through uh, there is an order to this and a predictability, a, a kind of orientation. And here when you get closer, and again, another early scheme, and this will be interesting, uh, Skip, I don't know if you, anybody remembers this, but one of my earliest ideas here was that of course we save Choctaw, but we put Choctaw under glass, and that we build a gigantic glass structure over it with a, a great hall for entertaining um, here. That fell by the wayside rather quickly as the numbers were crunched a little bit. I still think it would be really wonderful. Um, words, uh, celebration circle uh, still exists. The axis is there. And at that time, the building was projected uh, to actually uh, fly out over the river. And that was uh, put to rest by the Secret Service that said, you know, you can't do that. Um, and that'll relate to a story which will come up in a minute about uh, uh, President Bush if I have time. And early thoughts about the restoration of the bridge across the river uh, at a cartoon level, which is where they will remain for a while until all the dust settles uh, and the money is raised, which we hope it will be. These, on the other hand, are cross sections where the first idea of how we enclose the exhibits in double story space that there might be an entry level, it doesn't really show, or did we know quite how you'd get up there, maybe a residence on top, again, we weren't sure about that, uh, but it's facing west, that's the, that's the important point. And you can see now there's a, a very thin um, section right there, which we now call the belly, and I'll come back to that in a, in a moment. Uh, this, uh, then, these are drawings and models that George Hargraves did uh, showing the two different grids and how they reflect themselves on the site itself. And you can actually feel that when you're out there walking, uh, walking around. And it was a device to help organize uh, parking places for outdoor events. There were tents up there recently just taken down. Whoopsie, sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, now, the design went public. Um, I don't know if Bruce was, is that you? I'm not sure. Skip, I'm not sure whether you were there or not. This is um, in the White House. And you can see the president, the first lady, the senator. You know. And I was told by the uh, White House staff that you have three minutes or four minutes to present the building. And I said, I can't do that. I mean, this is, a, this is a complicated building. I knew I had only one shot at making this public and getting people to understand at least some of the things that I'm explaining in somewhat more detail here. And about 25 minutes later, I ended. <laughs> and I think I was forbidden by all of the Clinton people from ever speaking publicly again about the building, <laughs> but I did it. Anyway, they were pleased, and I think uh, we got wonderful press out of it, uh, and the launch was made. Just other doodles. This is the infamous napkin sketch. It is really a napkin that uh, that Richard and I swiped from the map room on that day. There's just a whole stack of them, so we figured one would be okay. And it has the presidential seal on it. And that's Celebration Circle. <laughs> now, it was done after the fact. I mean, every, everybody believes the, that architects draw on airplanes on napkins, and that's where it all starts. Sometimes, but rarely. Uh, there are uh, drawings that young kids in the office have fun with, but nobody else in the world can understand, uh, such as the nature of the computer. But the point of this was, and I, I, I actually, I love it as a drawing. I find it hard to call it a drawing, of course, because it doesn't look like a drawing. But it captured the sense of the structure and actually is not so far distant from the way this is actually built, uh, the great front porch that we have here looking west, and of course, uh, the, the Rock Island uh, Bridge. This, there is a story about, uh, it's brief, I'll make it, I have to make it brief, but you see one of the challenges of a building that cantilevered 90 feet out, this is very early on, in this particular case, as we get people out here, what if we have an emergency? How do we get them down? And they can't go back into the core and go to the ground. So we had to take them out here. 
And the president saw this model, and I was there, and he said, what's that? <laughs> and I said, well, that's uh, the way one gets out of the building and down. He said, well, I don't know, it looks to me like a fire escape. And I said, Mr. President, it is a fire escape. <laughs> he said, well, you're from New York, you know, and you got those things, but I don't like it. And we did go back to the drawing board, and uh, you, this is really kind of the beginning of grappling with it. You can see it's there, and there wasn't much sort of a chopped off cantilever, then it slips back further, and we, we hid from the question of it. Here was the very meeting, actually, and you can see that stair right there. And he's probably saying, get rid of it as we speak. Um, and here it is again on, on that model, here being Choctaw, here being the Rock Island Bridge. There's Joe Stanley uh, and Kevin McClurkin working on something or pretending to work on something, and I'm not exactly sure what. Uh, groundbreaking, I think that uh, somehow Skip is right there. Bruce might be right there. I'm not sure who's where, um, that the mayor's there. And there's Dean uh, himself. It was a happy day because we were moving ahead. Uh, the budget seemed to be OK. And uh, we went forward with construction. And you can see here, that is the outline of the site. And when I referred to uh, parts of the landscape that, that still uh, are not done, and eventually it will happen, will be turned into what um, I think it was Ralph or somebody here called a urban fishing ground, an urban, urban fishing ground. I suppose Lake Erie is an urban fishing ground. <clears throat> but we do depend on a certain amount of jargon and narrative and storytelling because we have to explain these buildings to people who are responsible ultimately for paying for them and even more so living with them. So this was a, a fairly early rendering. Uh, I hated this drawing because it was so cold. Everything was so hard-edged, and that's the problem with the, with the computer. The age of watercolor is over because clients say, how do I know it's right? How do I know that's true? So you show them something like this, they say, oh, it looks real. But it's not real. It's not any more real than, than the watercolor. Um, there are more elaborate renderings we did. Um, during the time when money was being raised, because these drawings have many purposes. Uh, one is to, to uh, convince the body politic and those in charge, the city, planning, parks department here in Little Rock that we're doing the right thing and that we're collaborating and listening to them. And others are to raise money, um, raise consciousness and so forth. And that's what these were for. We were uh, conscious very early on of the importance of the night view of the building. And I think that there was a reference made to this. Here, um, you can see something a few of you have seen. You may remember it. These are the bones of the building. But we didn't really hide the bones. We actually left the bones. It's, that's why we call it an exoskeleton. It's really outside, uh, of, outside of, the, of the skin of the building or woven in between the skin of the building. There is a timeline you've seen running through this, and but I re-edited this and put other things in so the timeline isn't always accurate. But in this case, it is. This is around 2003 in this particular picture. Then we had to test other things. One of the real concerns with this structure um, was uh, wind, and particularly uplift. That is, I mean, you get very big storms here, and it's a very, very exposed uh, site. Uh, whether or not uh, one day this thing was just going to lift right up. And so it was wind tested in a tunnel uh, here uh, by engineers who do nothing more. This was the model that's used. It's a kind of plexiglass. Uh, and uh, the answer came back uh, that some adjustments were made in the steel structure and so forth. And we went on from there to what you see here, um, using very thinly, um, very thin pieces of metal not encased in concrete because there is a paint uh, that can be used, which is acceptable uh, in, in all jurisdictions that I know of in lieu of the heavy concrete, which kept everything thinner. But this is a west wall, and I think only it would take a president like William Jefferson Clinton to 
uh, say, I like that, I want that, because in uh, the normal world of building, um, buildings that face west, and for some reason we have many that do, uh, have particularly urgent uh, and sometimes almost insoluble uh, problems with solar gain. And we solved it by, I remember very early in that big pamphlet, we, we had, what are they called? Dog trot houses? And they have little front verandas and porches, and so we would represent this as a kind of front porch, uh, native to Little Rock, which is a stretch of the imagination to anybody. But it kept the discussion going. And it is a front porch. Um, I guess they don't allow people to go out there now uh, readily. Well, then we had construction, the administration of the construction. This is a place where we, the designers, uh, we pull back. It's already in, a, in many ways out of our hands. We come back when they say, you can't afford to do this. But by this time, it's almost too late. We're in the, we're in the ground. We're out of the ground. Uh, the structure that you see here uh, is exactly uh, the way that uh, it appears. Uh, one of the things that we did, of course, was to use a heating and cooling system that's embedded in the floors of the building. Uh, the floors themselves are made of bamboo, uh, which actually is very porous. It's also a wood that grows so fast that in using it, it grows back practically before you've installed that which has been uh, cut down. Um, so it is, it's, it is an extremely sophisticated uh, mechanical system that Norman Kurtz of Flack and Kurtz uh, designed, and you can see in the date now we are all the way about a quarter into 2004. And the, the, the uh, sod is arriving on the site, the great carpet that finally um, completes this celebration circle is built, uh, the bollards are in, the bollards which you all you see on either side of the building are a security requirement to keep 75 feet away, uh, keep vehicles 75 feet away from the building. It's a federal uh, requirement. Um, the, the kind of heart or s the heart of the building is this elliptical piece here, which is directly below the orientation theater where people come to be received, to ask questions, to buy tickets, and, and, and so forth. Uh, and it was a piece of cabinetry that was a building in itself. It's so wired with so many kinds of things. And, and one of the, of course, we, we had to deal with security here, and that, that was always a, a challenge. I think it's finally been solved. I wish it would go away altogether, but it hasn't. And then we come to the opening. One day to go. Couldn't believe it. Yeah. And with one day to go, we were ready to go, and there you are, and you all remember that day. <laughs> but it was handled so well. The, the, the Secret Service um, wouldn't allow people to bring umbrellas on the site, and all the Clinton people knew that, so I think they went out and bought 14,000 umbrellas, a little folding kind, and ponchos, and they were given to everybody after they had been cleared to come in. So it was... It may have been wet, but it was extremely colorful and absolutely memorable. Uh, on that day, there you can see uh, uh, the senator, then I guess first lady at that time, and uh, the four presidents exiting uh, from it. I have many more pictures of them inside. Uh, I just have to tell this anecdote if I get it right. President Bush's Secret Service insisted that there be gunboats on the Arkansas River that kind of would steam. And I, I didn't know what they were at first. I just saw these boats. And they're, they're very cute. They're sort of orange, and they have guns and things. And they were going up and down the river. Um, just before they walked either out or in, I can't recall which they're doing then, but they had a private tour, and I was stationed one place, and Richard all got another. And, I think Ralph was someplace, and, and so forth. And as they came down the stairs, uh, Karl Rove came first. It's an anecdote I'll skip tonight. Uh, <laughs> and we were sitting and chatting after it was not sitting, standing and chatting, and Ralph was there, and, he was, and I was right next to him, and he was chatting with President Bush. And President Bush was mumbling like, he did, boy, I can't, I see that river, I'd love to get back to Texas as soon as I can and go bass fishing. And Ralph 
say, well, Mr. President, this don't don't go back. I mean, this is a great great river. And he said, there's lots of great bass there. I don't know if that's true or not, but he <laughs> Ralph said it, and the president all of a sudden got serious and said. Oh, no. Ralph said, there's plenty of bass in there. And he said, you know, you could go fishing there if, there, if, if those gunboats weren't going up and down. And the president got serious. He said, we need those gunboats. A submarine could come right out of that water and blow us all off the face of the earth. <laughs> and I heard it. So, enough said. Um, this is the team of people from our office, except for um, Norman Kurtz, who sadly died not, not too long after this, actually. Um, but you notice that it's, it's a big female team. <laughs> Kevin is the man. He arranged that way, but uh, I, I won't go through all of the names of them, but they're absolutely brilliant. There's Richard and myself, of course, but these one, two, three, four women, and then Susan Strauss, who handles all the research in the office, was there as well. Um, they really made this thing happen. You know, we may have done doodles, and, and we may be the fast talkers and fast walkers, but they really are the ones that deserve the credit. And there it is, uh, in all of its glory. Um, it is really it is the most thrilling building for me. I can't tell you. I've been, Ellen and I have been in and out of it and in and out of it all day long. And uh, uh, I, I, I know that uh, she's well aware and has lived with many of these buildings for a long time. And particularly, she went to law school at Columbia University before Lee became president. And I got the commission to do this major new front edition and, and many other aspects of the, of, of the law school. And she just said, please, <laughs> don't embarrass me with this. <laughs> Make it work. And, and we did. And we've been through a lot of these. And it, it bears certain relationship to this building, as a matter of fact, because these buildings, we really, as an office, don't do commercial buildings. We don't work for developers. We don't do malls. We don't do private residences. Once in a blue moon. Uh, we do buildings that have stories and narratives about them that are emblematic. Now, that's by choice. It's, it's not some place you can start out with. It takes a long time to achieve that kind of reputation that brings people to you. These are just photos that are so dramatically beautiful and which you cannot really see unless you're in one of those gunboats. <laughs> But there, the stair you see that finally arrived is slipped in between that double support. And as you sit, as we have done several times over the last couple of days in the cafe, um, keeping your eyes squinted because of the color of the walls, which is not to be blamed on anybody at the foundation or the Clinton Center or our office, but it's only paint. Um, and finally, what has become one of the signature photographs of, of, of this place, it's night with the American flag waving in the breeze. Um, there will never be another presidential library like this. The Bush Library, which is going to be in uh, Southern Methodist University in, I guess, Houston, I, Dallas, Dallas, I get them confused, and, um, is going to be a Georgian building uh, by choice of the president and his people. It is a building that will reflect the uh, antique minds that are at work. <laughs> I, I, I didn't rehearse that. And I, and I have my wife in the first row give, giving me signals. You know, so. One of my favorite photographs, it's just a, it is a shaped landscape. It is a man-made, it is a man-made place, but it's meant to hold the events, accidental and planned, that will occur here over years to come. And of course, I said earlier in the lecture how important the glow is at night as you come in from the airport, as you land at the airport, if you're on the right side of the airplane, 
um, it jumps out at you. And so I actually planned to end right there, but I then was uh, importuned by some in the audience here uh, last night to say, well, show a few recent things, at least stuff that you're working on. And so I'm going to do this very briefly. It's interesting that two of them, though, uh, are, are profoundly involved with the First Amendment. Um, well, actually more than two, three. This is a building in Philadelphia, uh, right on Independence, Independence Mall, the Constitution Center, uh, Constitution Hall, the Liberty Bell. The park has all been redesigned, and it's right here on the corner of Fifth and Market. Um, we had an earlier site down here, and uh, it didn't work, and they got the, the client got this corner. And it is a museum of the 350 years of American Jewish history. Um, but the key to it all, and something that I insisted on, um, I'm not going to, that's an earlier scheme on the previous site. This is the building that you see here. It's made of really two materials, terracotta, which is reflective of this beautiful terracotta bourse, uh, which is a historic building next to it here, and this, this glass, not unlike the glass on the Clinton Library. The intention of this piece and what will be in it is called the freedom of experience, and it will uh, explain, explore, expose um, both the travail in the early years and the great successes uh, of the Chinese and Italians and Laotians, and I could go on and on and on who have come to this country. And then as you move into what we call the treasure box, it's really where the exhibits are that you can see here, uh, will be the history of, of uh, Judaism in America. Uh, and that building is going to be finished in about a year. Um, and again, we had to deal with the National Park Service, with the, with the Art Commission of the City of Philadelphia. Um, it, uh, it is a, a complicated building with a very clear idea and a building which does have a relationship to the Clinton Library in the sense of materials and its public expression. Whoops. Um, this is a, a building that was just completed in Washington, D.C. I guess it opened on April 11th. Um, it is called the Museum. Uh, it is a museum of news and the media and uh, a celebration of the First Amendment built by the Freedom Forum, which is the Gannett, uh, essentially the Gannett Foundation. Um, what you see to the right is the way we, we work in the office on most projects, public we, we fiddle around with different models. And the, the, the people, that, the, the client here came to us and said, we love the planetarium in New York. It's iconic. We want an icon. And after a little bit, I went to Mr. Overby, the chairman of the board, and I said, you know, this is not about planets or dinosaurs. I mean, the, 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 these are newspapers. That's not particularly iconic. And then, uh, he or his number two, Peter Pritchard, gave to us uh, a huge notebook of photographs they had been collecting and collecting and collecting. And we noticed there, and I'll come to this in a minute, I just want to mention the site. Uh, there is the site. That is the Capitol building. There's the White House. It's, it, it is on Pennsylvania Avenue. It's on the inauguration route. And uh, it just couldn't be a more prominent by directly across the street from the west wing of the National Gallery and I am Pei's east wing of the National Gallery. Um, so we looked through all these photographs, and what we saw and came out of it were these, these doodles. We saw that in China, news is pasted on walls. In the Detroit Free Press, once upon a time, was lo looked at through windows. Uh, Families in the 50s gathered around a funny little old television set and looked at it through a window. Uh, and so we used um, the, a window on the world, or all the world's a stage, a proscenium, in which the actors are there and the observers are outside. The idea of transparency and democracy. And of course, layers and newspapers. And kind of mix those things up. And Ralph, who, uh, uh, Applebaum, who did the exhibits for the Clinton Library, uh, likewise was our collaborator there. So you can see that the building we came up with indeed is a window on the world, and there is this 84-foot high uh, Tennessee marble plaque that has on it 
uh, the words of the First Amendment engraved in it in stone forever, directly on the inauguration route. Um, the great window made of this low iron glass, it's very, very clear, uh, looks into exhibits, and you can see in the cross section uh, that there is a screen inside uh, uh, that uh, can broadcast breaking news or no news or used for a single head or face for a memorial or a party or whatever happens to go on. There are three layers to the building. And then in the end, and they're all on the grid of Washington, D.C. You can see them here. But the last one actually uh, are kind of high-end uh, uh, rental apartments that create the revenue. And there you see it in the, the day. And straight ahead, of course, is the Capitol. And here in the interior, there is this great atrium that's crisscrossed by stairs and escalators, uh, allowing people to look at people. These bridges cross uh, across that big open window. And there are more windows at the base on Pennsylvania Avenue. Each one of these boxes contains every day a front page of 250 different domestic and foreign newspapers. Not only out here. There are, some, there are about 150 on the street and there are another 100 up on the, on, the, on the fifth floor. But you can see there is the National Gallery across the street, people walking on the bridge. And this is, uh, I'd say before that it's like a village. It has a super fancy restaurant and it has a popular food court and it has, I don't know, nine different theaters of different kinds and it even has, in a way, a chapel. And this is it. It is a memorial to fallen journalists. And it will continue, sadly, to grow uh, as journalists risk their lives. And then um, there is another building devoted to the First Amendment, which does not show up quite so clearly here in these few photographs. This is the Newhouse School of Journalism at Syracuse University, which was dedicated six months ago, nine months ago, not, not, not very long ago. And though you, there, there are a lot of things here, this, this great scroll, like a piece of paper, actually reflects the curvilinear street uh, outside it, but it also is a kind of scroll. And we had, it also faces west, just like the Clinton Library. We had to develop a, a way of screening it. And, and I worked um, with my team of people there, and I said, you know, I want to squint at it and have it look like a newspaper. And they said, well, we can do that, and, but it also looks like a digital image um, as well. And I said, that's even better, because that is what it's about. These are students at one of the two or three great journalism schools uh, in, in, in the country. Now, what you can't see is between this base wall and here, there is a clear glass wall, and on this wall, wrapping all the way around the building, is, again, the First Amendment. In this case, you cannot see it from the inside. You can only see it from the outside. It's a technical trick of embossing, embossing glass. So it's done in a very different way, but the same purpose uh, is, is there. So I'm not going to take time to go in. You can see it's an extremely dramatic building, the way it reflects the light, and that light penetrates the interior. Uh, where there are also bridges that cross from different classrooms and, and functions uh, in the building. And this is, of course, the end of it, uh, looking uh, across to the main building of, of Syracuse. And finally, I think, I went too long, I think, but uh, no, I didn't go too long. Well, I'm not going to go much longer anyway. But um, this is a co very controversial project I've been working on for a long time, also with Ralph. It is, there is a Maya Lin's Vietnam a Memorial. Uh, here is a little street named after the architect for the Lincoln Memorial, which is here, Bacon Drive. This is um, an empty piece of absolutely dead flat land. It is the end of the National Mall, but it is still on the National Mall officially. And by an act of Congress, um, the Vietnam Veterans Fund was given permission to build a visitor center. Well, a, a, I don't think we could call it a memorial center. It is not a memorial. It is a place that will, where the, the names on the wall will come alive. They will have faces. And on the birthday of each one of those 55,000 people who died, uh, their face will be there with their history. Their families will know that day, so of course they'll be able to visit. But there'll also be a history, a timeline. There'll also be a collection of the some 
oh gosh, almost 45 to 50,000 objects that have been left at the wall. Uh, it really, it brings tears to your eyes to, to think about it. And so the mandate was that the building had to be below ground, and there isn't an inch of this building that's above the sidewalk level. The reason it's so visible here, of course, is you've moved to the very edge, getting ready to go down to an intermediate level where you enter. And from that entrance, there's a series of ramps that you can see a little bit here, a little bit more here. There's an overlook to the name and face wall that I mentioned before. And then finally, you get to the bottom, and you walk through an open uh, memorial courtyard. And then there's a resource center for more information, and you come up and you go out. It's controversial, like all buildings in Washington are controversial. Um, and I do think it is going to happen uh, uh, because it is an act of Congress. And uh, I am um, I'm in love with this project. It, is, it, it, it requires all the passion one can put into it and patience, I might add. And finally, the actually absolute opposite of a project like that. This is what is now euphemistically called a water treatment plant. In fact, it is a sewage treatment plant for about a quarter to a third of all of New York City. Um, the federal government said, rebuild it or else. Uh, it's a two and a half to three billion dollar project. It's been going on for eight or nine years. It'll go on for another six or seven years. Uh, and it is highly visible from uh, the highways leading uh, from the east in, into New York City. These big digesters are here. And the reason that we became the architects, engineers designed it. It is an engineering uh, feat. But when it was taken to the New York City Art Commission, uh, I, I sit on that commission now, but I didn't at that time, the Art Commission said, uh, you better go out and get a real architect, because we're not going to accept this. It's too visible to the public. And so we were selected by the engineers, two, three teams of engineers, actually. and. I love this kind of project. It, it certainly lacks the emotion of the Vietnam project, but it, ha it is just supremely rational. Everything had to work. And they accepted our idea to create a place where, and I don't know, you, you can sort of see it. Yeah, you can see up here there are glass enclosed walkways that end up in turrets on top of here so that school children can go, and it becomes an educational facility so that visiting groups can find out what happens to all of that waste uh, that is becoming a bigger and bigger problem in our cities. So with that, um, I always like to end with these two. <laughs> I guess I don't really have to say very much, but that's what architecture is for me, that happy Italian in his mud bath and the emptiness of Freud's couch. Thank you very much. <laughs>
It's about a half a mile to the closest bus. You get lots of points for that. Um, working with the city authorities, we cut the parking requirement from 704 to 369 cars. Um, all the fixtures are low flow fixtures. Uh, the landscape irrigation system, and you can see there's a lot of, it's all on sensors, so water is minimally used. And finally, of course, the biggest thing in a way is the energy use. It it's, uses 25 percent less energy than the current ASHRAE code requirement. I mentioned the radiant floor. The, the belly of the whale, which I made a reference to but did not adequately show you, and you can see it, is that, that piece that hangs under the building. Uh, because it's a free span, there are no columns uh, within it, um, is not heated or cooled. So there's a big chunk of the building. Then uh, the archives are half below grade. Uh, that too, and, and, and we are 100 feet back in the floodplain, so there's no fear of there ever being uh, damaged. There's a, an array of voltaic uh, cells on the roof of the archive building that generate energy. And the whole building is what is called, in jargon, a smart building. It's, it's all the systems are computer controlled. 22% of the materials are recycled. Um, the bamboo floors, 40% uh, of the materials were manufactured within 500 miles of Little Rock. Those are all issues. Light and air, 100% of the museum, and all of the archive offices um, have visual access to the outside. So that means you use much less electricity. And in that, we needed the collaboration of the exhibition designers because a lot of that stuff can't take uh, direct sunlight. And finally, and happiest of all, is it is a long life building. It will lead, live at least 100 years, and uh, it does so in a way because it provides maximum flexibility in the future. All of those things added up. Um, finally, in the end, it wasn't quite platinum, it was silver. And then uh, something happened, which was planned initially, but for uh, uh, cost reasons was deferred, which was a green roof, a literal green roof on the top, um, partly so the president can putt, um, <laughs> and also for growing plants and so forth. And that work has been completed, and that kind of pushed us over the top, and we got the platinum. Thanks. It was a good question, and I'm glad I emailed my office. <laughs> Any other questions? We have one. Is there one? Okay, right here. Sorry. Uh, what do you wish you hadn't done? Uh, did you make any mistakes that you could have uh, I, intend, I, I, intend I can, to improve? When he gets through, can Bruce or that and I you will address? Question? No. <laughs> what do I wish I hadn't done? Wake up this morning. Um, I. I really, you know, I've been in that building now for the last couple of days. I've spent a lot of time in there. I was worried about the softness of the bamboo floor and women's heels, but people don't wear heels like that all the time anymore, so it's holding up. Um, I have really fewer reservations about that building than I have of probably most of the 250 other public structures I've done in the last 50 years. Um, I hope that will never change. It just is due to all these folks that just stood up and everybody here, it's about as good as it gets. Uh, ask me about some of the other buildings I showed you, I could give you answers. What impact do you feel this building has had upon the built environment of this city? And what do you foresee? Well, it's had a huge effect. I mean, uh, the, 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 for instance, the selecting of the site for the Heifer uh, International uh, there, I, I don't know for sure, but I cannot help but believe that the, you could tell me more, the presence of the library was a, uh, an important factor. Um, it's a part of town that when we first came here, uh, I remember Kevin saying, don't drive there. Um, <laughs> It, it certainly is upgraded uh, in, in many ways, and it is made Little Rock, which I think was always a kind of secret destination for those that knew, but this certainly now has put this 
city on the architectural map. And I hope, I hope and I believe by simply looking around at some of the buildings that, that uh, Polk, Stanley are doing and other architects that I, I, I really don't know very well, that it's, it's, it's raised the bar on quality. And I hope that it has also affected and infected the real estate development community to reach further and uh, don't always be ruled by that bottom line. And I, I've never been happy, and the saddest part of that building for me is, and this is partially your answer, that we can't visit it all the time. It's just too far away. Got a question right back here, Annie. I just visited the pyramids, and it made me wonder and have respect for the architects of the pyramids. What is the dream and expectations of an architect? Is it the preservation of a relic for future, future, future generations to model at your talent or not? I didn't hear the end of that question. Why? What? Do you want future generations to marvel at your talent? The answer to that is yes. No, actually, the answer is no. I have never been particularly inspired by the architecture of the Renaissance in Europe. My two most seminal youthful travel experiences, my wife and I, was first uh, courtesy of that great senator from Arkansas, Senator Fulbright, to go to Denmark and get to know Scandinavia very well. And the other was the opportunity I had to design the very first buildings I ever designed in Japan. And so pre-Meiji Japan, that is pre-modern Japan, and Scandinavia in the cultural respect for architecture and the traditional attitude toward the merger of landscape and building. And uh, the control of egos. And so I have been much more inspired by those buildings and of the kind of early Cistercian uh, abbeys and churches of the south of France and the north of Italy, and the architects had no names. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. Let's hear it for Jim Polshek.